we are going to start now <coughs> right welcome back so we have seen uh, the development of the gonads okay and then we have seen we were seeing about the development of the genital ducts okay so we know that uh, in females the paramesonephric duct they develop okay and the mesonephric duct they degenerate okay the two paramesonephric duct they unite with one another whereas the mesonephric duct they do not unite with one another okay the mesonephric duct they open on either side either side of the sinovaginal bulb okay okay so here you can see the paramesonephric duct so they unite to one another near the caudal region okay and this united part is the one which develops into the uterus and the upper part of the vagina okay so they develop from the upper part of the vagina okay so now we will see this part the cranial part of the paramesonephric duct is the one which develops into the fimbria fimbria and the ampulla okay the cranial part of the paramesonephric duct okay the next part okay they move close towards the urogenital ridge okay and then they fuse in the midline as i said before okay and then they form the uterus okay they form the uterus okay and as they fuse with one another there is a transverse pelvic fold formed which forms the broad ligament of the uterus okay so as they come and they get united okay so there will be a sheet of um, a uh, layer okay which which they uh, which they bring along okay because they are located laterally and then they move towards the midline right so as they come along they bring a sheet of uh, peritoneum along with them okay and these are the ones which forms the broad ligament okay and then you know that the anterior part between the urinary bladder and the uterus it is called as vesica uterine pouch and between the uterus and the rectum it's the recto uterine pouch okay so thereby after the development of the uterus and the broad ligaments the two pouches becomes prominent okay recto uterine as well as vesica uterine pouch or you can say the either way okay so recto uterine or vesica uterine pouch okay the fused part of the paramesonephric duct that's the one which develops into the uterus as well as into the cervix okay and what happens this uterus the fused fused part of the paramesonephric duct they get surrounded by the mesenchyme okay and this mesenchyme is the one which helps in the formation of the myometrium and the perimetrium okay the myometrium and the perimetrium you know the uterus okay it is the uh, this is the corpex okay the corpus that is the um, the frontal part of the uterus okay and this is the lower most part which is the cervix okay so the fused portion of the paramesonephric duct they forms the uterus okay and also the upper portion of the vagina <clears throat> and later on what happens this fused portion is surrounded by the mesenchyme and this surrounding part of the mesenchyme is the one which develops into myometrium and then the outer perimetrium okay myometrium and perimetrium the innermost part is the one which is the endometrium okay so those things must have already you must have discussed it in your uh, physiology as well as in your histology okay <clears throat> all right now here you can see once again how the broad ligament is formed so here you can see this is the gonadal ridge okay this is the mesonephros okay and the blue color is the mesonephric duct okay and the uh, orange colored one so that's the paramesonephric duct now what happens as these two paramesonephric duct come towards the center near the caudal region they bring along the fold of mesenchyme along with them which forms the broad ligament and as you can see once this broad ligament is formed the ovary is located posterior to the broad ligament okay so now you know like why the ovary is located 
posteriorly okay it's facing posteriorly okay so that's because of the formation of the broad ligament okay <coughs> okay so this is the two paramesonephric duct which is fused and this is the mesonephric duct okay <coughs> now let's see the development of the vaginal part so what happens after this to fusion of the paramesonephric duct okay so they open into the sino vaginal bulb okay so the paramesonephric ducts reach the urogenital sinus okay there will be two solid evaginations which is called as sino vaginal bulbs okay they grow out from the pelvic part of the urogenital sinus okay now let's see that here so here you can see the two paramesonephric duct they are joining together okay and then they form the paramesonephric duct the uterus okay the uterus which is initially separated by a septum okay but then this septum finally disappears okay and this is the urogenital sinus okay now there is a proliferation from the urogenital sinus and there is a proliferation from the paramesonephric duct as well okay now you can see this proliferation so this is the sign of urogenital sinus okay so there will be a proliferation from here towards the paramesonephric duct and from the paramesonephric duct towards here as well okay and this proliferation they later on they get uh, they get they get transformed into the vagina and the hymen sorry the vagina went to the upper and lower parts of the vagina so now you know that the upper one third of the vagina it is developed from the paramesonephric duct whereas the lower two thirds it is developed from the sino vaginal bulb okay so this sino vaginal bulb it is formed both from paramesonephric duct as well as from the urogenital sinus the proliferations okay so in the upper to upper one third it is for developed from the paramesonephric duct whereas the lower two thirds it is developed from the uro, the sino vaginal bulb okay which is coming from the urogenital sinus all right any doubts so this sino vaginal bulb proliferate to form the solid vaginal plate okay so then what happens proliferation continues until the cranial end of this uro, the plate increasing the distance between the uterus and the urogenital sinus okay so this sino vaginal bulb they keep on proliferating thereby increasing the distance from the urogenital sinus towards the uterus okay then what happens <clears throat> by fifth month the vaginal outgrowth is is canalized okay and the vaginal fornices they get uh, they they will be formed okay the vaginal fornix which is present on uh, the other uh, the surrounding parts of the cervix so that will be formed okay so after this uh, the canalization okay so they will be forming the fornix okay the fornix as well as the vaginal part the upper one third is developed from the paramesonephric and lower two thirds is from uh, the sino vaginal bulb okay the connection between this uh, sino vaginal bulb and the urogenital sinus it's initially covered by a small membrane which is called as the hymen okay which is called as the hymen okay so thus the vagina has got two origins the upper part is developed from the uterine canal that is the paramesonephric duct the lower part is developed from the urogenital sinus okay the lumen of the vagina remains separated from that of the urogenital by a thin tissue plate the hymen okay the hymen consists of an epithelial lining of the sinus and a thin layer of vaginal cells it usually develops an opening during the perinatal life okay during the perinatal means that uh, once the fetus gets uh, during at the time of delivery okay so or after delivery the hymen usually will open up okay the hymen usually open up okay so that's it all right <clears throat> so here you can see the uterine canal 
the sinovaginal bulb which is opening into the urogenital sinus okay the urogenital sinus okay so then the here you can see this is the coronal section this is the sagittal section so here you can see from the sinovaginal bulb there is a they will be forming the sinovaginal bulb okay and the paramecium effect that they will also form some proliferation so the upper one third okay so they will form the upper one third of the vagina and they proliferate between the cervix thereby leading out to the formation of fornix okay and the lower two thirds they form the lower two thirds of the, the from the sinovaginal bulb they form the vagina okay so the opening is initially protected by a small membrane which is the hymen okay now let's see the remnants so we have seen the remnants of the paramesonephric duct in males similarly there will be remnants of mesonephric duct in females <coughs> okay so the remnants of the cranial and caudal excretory tubules okay so they form the epiphron and parophron the mesonephric duct they disappear except for a small cranial portion and a small caudal portion okay the small caudal portion might develop into a cyst which is called as gartner cyst <coughs> excuse me So here in this picture, you are able to see uh, all the structures. So here you can see <clears throat> epiphron, parophron, okay, and the Gartner cyst. Okay, so these are the remnants of the mesonephric ductules, mesonephros. and the mesonephric duct okay so and the gartner cyst near the uh, <coughs> junction between the upper one third and the lower two thirds okay of the vagina so here you can see epiphron parophron and the gartner cyst now let's see the anomalies so what happens you know that the two paramesonephric duct they unite to form the uterus and now what happens if these two paramesonephric duct do not unite so they will form double uterus so here if there is completely non union okay so the two paramesonephric duct they do not open so as a result there will be two vagina okay in the upper one third okay so in the upper one third there will be two vaginas and two uterus okay if the caudal portion is united but not the cranial portion so there will be double uterus with single vagina okay then if the cervix is united then it leads on to what is called as bicornuate uterus okay and if one of the paramesonephric duct is not developed it is called as a rudimentary rudimentary horn okay so only one uterus is one part of the uterus is developed okay sometimes sorry sometimes the septate okay septate this one uh, with the, the septum between the uh, two paramesonephric duct they remain and which is called as a septate uterus sometimes only one paramesonephric duct develops the other paramesonephric duct will not develop this condition is called as unicornuate uterus all right so these are some of the anomalies of the uterus <clears throat> okay so the anomalies of the hymen so the uh, normal hymen so it is usually open okay during the perinatal period okay sometimes if it is not open okay it might lead on to incomplete perforation okay or septate hymen okay cribriform hymen micro perforate hymen or imperforate hymen okay so now what are the uh, why this is important especially in the last one in perforate hymen so what is the what will be the presentation so usually that uh, they will not find out okay so they cannot uh, they uh, they will they will say that the child has not attained menarche okay so they will, the, the mother will be anxious and then they will bring the child okay saying that uh, she has not attained uh, menarche 
so what would be the what are the history or the things you need to look for you need to assess the child regarding the development of the secondary sexual characters okay so regarding the development of thylash that is the, the hair growth over the genital regions in the axilla and also the breast development you need to assess okay and if these both are developed okay and then uh, you need to ask the history in the history if you can ask uh, look for any uh, periodical abdominal pain okay so every month if the child has got a severe abdominal pain okay then uh, these are some of the histories and examination findings especially in a case of imperforate hymens so what happens there will be periods in this child okay but because the hymen is not open the menstrual uh, blood would be collected beyond uh, in the upper part okay so what happens is there will be severe abdominal pain periodical abdominal pain the secondary sexual characters will be developed okay so in this case you need to do the examination of the uh, genital system okay and then you need to make an incision over the hymen to release the uh, to make the opening up okay so this is uh, regarding the imperforate hymen okay now coming lastly to the development of the external genitalia okay the development of the external genitalia <clears throat> now the external genitalia it is same during the indifferent stage then slowly it develops into a male if there is the development of the testis determining factor okay if this tdf is not present then it develops into a uh, into a female so now what are the changes okay in the third week okay the mesenchymal cells originating in the primitive streak migrate around the cloacal membrane and form the part of the cloacal fold okay so here there is the formation of the cloacal fold from the cloacal membrane okay so from the cloacal membrane okay which is the terminal portion okay the regarding the uh, uh, near the urogenital sinus okay the terminal portion of the cloaca so the cloaca the cloacal membrane so this is the cloacal fold cranial to the cloacal membrane the folds unite to form the genital tubercle okay so they will be forming the genital tubercle okay then what happens to this cloacal membrane okay this cloacal fold the cloacal fold they are subdivided into urethral fold anteriorly and anal fold posteriorly so here you can see they form two folds okay the urethral fold anteriorly and the anal fold posteriorly okay and another pair of elevations genital swellings becomes visible on each side of the urethral fold okay so this cloacal membrane okay so there will be swelling on either side of the urethral fold and that is called as genital swelling okay so that is called as genital swelling so here you can see the genital tubercle the urethral fold just parallel to the urethral fold is the genital swelling and this is the anal fold okay now this genital swelling is the one which transforms into scrotum in males okay and labia majora in females okay the genital swelling is the one which forms the scrotum in males and labia majora in females okay now let's see in males because male uh, development is slightly more complicated okay so let's see how, how it's getting transformed into the male so under the influence of androgens okay which is coming from the fetal testes okay so <clears throat> the genital tubercle the genital tubercle will start to develop because of the presence of the androgens okay so because of the presence of androgens the uh, genital tubercle they will start to develop into what is called as a phallus or the primitive penis okay phallus okay the primitive penis is it's called as phallus okay so during which the phallus pulls the urethral folds forwards so as the genital tubercle grows it also pulls 
is the urethral fold forwards okay and then <clears throat> so that they form the lateral wall of the urethral groove so as it pulls around as it goes uh, forwards so they pull along okay forming the urethral fold the urethral groove do not reach the most distal part okay so initially if you see the urethral fold will not reach the tip okay the urethral groove do not reach the distal part okay see here the urethral groove it is extending only until here okay the urethral fold is extending only until here okay it is not opening into the external part okay now here it is covered by a black line okay so what is this black line so the urethral fold is not opening into the exterior okay so this black thing is covering here the solid epithelial cord is covering the terminal part of the urethra okay so this is developed from the epithelium okay so the epithelial lining of the groove originates from the endoderm and then they form the urethral plane whereas the terminal part they develop from the ectoderm okay they develop from the terminal part of the urethra they develop from the ectoderm that's why the histology of the terminal part of the urethra what type of epithelium it is stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium the terminal part of the male urethra it is stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium after some time okay after this terminal part if you go slightly inside and then you take a biopsy it will be transitional epithelium but the terminal part it is stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium why the terminal part of the urethra alone is a transitional is a stratified squamous because they develop from the ectoderm okay all right at the end of the, any doubts in this one any develop in any doubts in this one so as this genital tubercle enlarges the urethral fold will also enlarge forming them into a group and then this urethral fold they will start to fuse okay they will be fusing from the caudal towards the cranial region they from the uh, anal part towards the genital tubercle side okay so that will be they will be fusing the along the urethral folds so thereby making it into a complete tube which is the urethra okay so which is the urethra all right so the urethral fold it will be extending only until here the terminal part it is developed from the ectoderm okay all right at the end of the third month the two urethral folds close over to form the urethral plate forming the penile urethra that's what we have discussed the canal does not extend to the tip of the penis okay or the phallus the most distal urethra is formed during the fourth month when the ectodermal cells from the tip of the glands penetrate inward forming the epithelial cord this cord obtains the lumen from the external urethral meatus the genital swellings they will enlarge forming the scrotum okay they are separated by the scrotal septum all right so any doubts in this <clears throat> so this is with regard to the external uh, genitalia development in males okay now let's see like because as you know that there are a lot of things which is happening here what are the abnormalities it can you uh, can suspect hypospadiasis <clears throat> i think it, this must have been already discussed with you okay so what happens in hypospadiasis because the urethral folds they are closing from here from the anal part towards here okay if any one of this part it's not fused what happens the urethra is opening on the ventral side of the penis okay so they will open on the ventral side of the penis and that is called as hypospadiasis okay hypospadiasis okay so this could be because of inadequate production of androgens or the receptors epispadiasis this is on the other side <coughs> on the dorsal surface okay on the dorsal surface of the penis so that is on the uh, 
I don't have a picture. Okay, so that is the genitourinary tract. They must have already taught you this one, the urethra. Okay, the dorsal surface of the penis, if the urethra open, so that is called as epispadiasis. Usually this is accompanied with extrophy of the bladder. Extrophy means the urinary bladder will also be open towards the exterior. Okay, so this is because of inadequate ectodermal, mesodermal interactions. Okay, during the development of the genital tubercle. Okay, because the ectoderm, mesoderm, they are not developed. Okay, uh, of the genital tract. This has not nothing to do with the androgens, epispadiasis. But hypospadiasis could be because of the androgens. Agenesis. Agenesis means absence of penis or clitoris. Okay, so the genital tubercle is not developed. Bifid penis or double penis. This is actually quite rare. So what happens is uh, it is often associated with the extrophy. That is the opening of the bladder. So what happens? The urethral tubercles, they will be forming two genital tubercles. Okay, so they will be forming two genital tubercle, okay, leading on to bifid penis or double penis, which is quite rare. Okay, micropenis, micropenis in which the penis is quite small and is usually hidden in the sup suprapubic pad of fat. Okay, so in front of the pubic symphysis, you know there is a large amount of fat which is called the suprapubic fat. Okay, in micropenis, sometimes the the penis will be so small that it gets embedded inside this fat. Okay, usually it is because of the fetal testicular failure. Okay, so this, you can see the hypospadiasis. So where it opens, where the urethra is not opening in the external urethral meatus. Okay, that's because the recanalization has not taken place here. And as a result, uh, the urethral fold is also not folded completely. Okay, and the urethra is opening into the uh, into the ventral surface of the penis. Okay, so this is called as hypospadiasis. Okay, this is needs to be treated. Okay, so when the when it, when the, when when it's a baby. Okay, hypospadiasis. Then here you can see agenesis, where there is uh, no sexual characters; they are not formed. Okay, so because of the agenesis of the external genitalia. Now let's see in female, what happens in female, there is nothing much change. Okay, so because of the production of estrogen, the genital tubercle elongates, but not much. Okay, the genital tubercle is present, the urethral folds are present, genital swelling is present. Okay, all are present in females, but it does not fuse. Okay, so what happens, this genital tubercle is enlarged, elongates slightly, but not much. Okay, and then it gets transformed into clitoris in, uh, in once the child is developed. Okay, the urethral folds, as I said before, it is not fused. Okay, as in males. Okay, and then they form the labia minora. Okay, the genital swellings, they enlarge and then they form the labia majora. Okay, the urogenital groove opens and forms the, the urogenital group. That is the part which is present here. <coughs> this is a urogenital sinus. Okay, so they open and then they form the vestibule. Okay, so here you can see, although the genital tubercle does not elongate extensively, it's larger than in males during the early stages. Okay, so that's why sometimes in ultrasound examination, uh, the doctors, they might uh, make mistakes. Okay, so they may say that it's a, it's a male baby, okay, but then when the, child, uh, when the child is born, the parents, they might be disappointed that it's a, uh, it's a female or they might think it's other gender or something. Okay, so that's why uh, confirmation is needed and you need to give a guarded reply, okay, saying that it could be because it could be a male child, okay, so until unless you are confirmed, okay, usually after the... Uh, 20th week, it will be more prominent. Okay, so after the 20th week, it, you can definitely say that if it is a male or a female. But before that, okay, so it is quite difficult to say whether if it is a male or a female. So that's because the genital tubercle is initially 
uh, larger in uh, male in females compared to that of uh, males all right now this is the last one the descent of testes this should have been already discussed with you but for completion sake i am just taking it up okay so the testicular descent it is as, as you know that the testis is initially present in the abdomen but then it slowly descends into the scrotum okay so why this occurs so the testicular descent is associated with the enlargement of the testis and the atro at atrophy of the mesonephrus okay the mesonephric part of the kidney they atrophy and because the testis gets enlarged also the atrophy of the paramesonephric duct they also assist in the testicular descent and this one mullerian inhibiting substance okay so that is also primarily involved with testicular this uh, descent okay and there has been research in which if there is uh, less or no secretion of this mis mullerian inhibiting substance the testicular descent doesn't take place okay so that's also one of the important thing the other one is enlargement of the processus vaginalis okay that is a part of the peritoneum which extends into the scrotum that's a processus vaginalis okay so when it enlarges it brings the testes along with it okay by 26th week testes have descended retroperitoneally from the posterior abdominal wall to the deep inguinal rings so they will reach that deep inguinal ring at the 26th week and from here there towards the scrotum apart from this mullerian inhibiting substance androgens gubernatal okay so they may also help in the in the descent of the testes okay they will then slowly descend along the inguinal canal <clears throat> and also because of the fetal posture you know the fetal posture is when it is inside the mother the hip and knees they are flexed okay and because of that the testis might descend into the uh, is it will descend into the scrotum okay so as the testis and the ductus deferens descend they are ensheathed by the facial extensions of the abdominal wall this is what we have seen the external spermatic fascia internal spermatic fascia cremastric fascia so that's all is because of the descent those structures <coughs> which come from the anterior abdominal wall okay so here you can see the testes initially present in the abdomen slowly comes through the deep inguinal ring inguinal canal and then it finally attains the scrotal position okay some theories say that there is a gubernaculum contraction the contraction of the gubernaculum assists in uh, bringing the testes down but some some other research says that it is mullerian inhibiting substance or the androgens and some say that it is the fetal posture so basically it is a combined effect of all the things okay and here you can see the final one as it brings along the external internal spermatic fascia okay all the structures then this is the processus vaginalis okay and if this processus vaginalis is persistent it's called as congenital hydrocele if it is fused on either sides it's called as encysted hydrocele <coughs> okay now what happens if the testis does not descend it's called as undescended testis or cryptorchidism okay so it can occur anywhere along the descent okay so you need to look along the inguinal canal okay now what you need to do is you need to bring down the testis okay immediately because this is very important okay so one of the important newborn checks especially in case of male child okay look if the testis has descended into the scrotum you need to palpate the scrotum and see if you can feel for the testis okay if it is if it is not seen then you need to do an ultrasound okay to ch check the location of the testis okay if it is along the path of descent you can just wait for one month or two months okay and if not <clears throat> you need to do a surgery to bring the testis down 
okay ectopic testes this is something which is not along the pathway okay so you know that the testis descends along the inguinal canal if it is not present along the pathway of the inguinal canal then it is called as ectopic testis okay so undescended testis and the ectopic testis <coughs> now what happens to the ovaries the ovaries also descend but not to a greater level as that of uh, as that of main okay they usually they descend a small amount okay so and uh, they uh, lie in the pelvis okay and uh, the cranial segment <coughs> of the ovary so that forms the suspensory ligament of the ovary and the part which attaches the ovary towards the uterus okay so that forms the round ligament of the uh, sorry the ligament of ovary okay so that forms the ligament of the ovary okay and uh, this part the caudal part of this they will be forming the round ligament of the uterus the genital ligaments okay so those are the genital ligaments which is coming from the peritoneum now this is the final chart <coughs> okay so which is given uh, taken from your langman okay so your questions can be coming from here also so that you will know that uh, you need to know from which structure what is uh, what is formed okay so here you can see the mesonephric duct so what are the structure it forms in males and what are the structure it forms in females okay so like that you can just differentiate okay on both the sides male and female <coughs> so this you must have been covered in the in the genital in the hematology immunology module okay so the in the turner syndrome which what happens is there is only 45 chromosomes okay so here the secondary sexual characters of the female they are not developed okay <coughs> and uh, lastly the ambiguous genitalia ambiguous genitalia means like it is uh, not it is uh, difficult to say whether if it is a male or a female child okay so what could that be due to so one of the reason is true hermaphroditism what is true hermaphrodit it means that they are having both ovarian as well as testicular tissues okay so this could be because of the presence of both chromosomes okay so some of the cells containing xx and some of them containing xy okay so that is a true hermaphroditism female pseudo hermaphroditism okay so what here it is the female pseudo hermaphroditism is is the here the child looks more like a male okay when the child is uh, born okay because the genital tubercle is more enlarged okay and it looks like a penis okay so that's because of the increased secretion of androgens okay increased the secretion of the androgens or it could be because of a tumor which is called a cah congenital adrenal hyperplasia okay so because of this androgens there will be increased secretion of these androgens and because of this increased secretion of androgens the genital tubercle will enlarge and the genital swelling will enlarge okay and then it looks like as if the child is a male okay but if you check the karyotyping it will be a female so that's why this is called as female pseudo hermaphrodite actually it's a female but it is looking like a male okay male pseudo hermaphroditism is just the opposite where the chromosome the karyotyping is xy okay but the penis and um, the scrotum they are not developed okay hypospadiasis okay so that could be here so this could be because of inadequate production of testosterone or malaria inhibiting substance okay so as a result the urethral folds they might not uh, fold okay which can lead on to bifid scrotum okay bifid scrotum okay and it might uh, you might think that it it could be a uh, the child the child could be a female okay you can think that uh, you might think that this child is a female okay but if you do a karyotyping you might be you will be able to find that this is a male child so that's because of inadequate secretion of testosterone okay 
that is male pseudo hermaphroditism okay so this is a case of female pseudo hermaphroditism so it's actually a female but having the male uh, features okay the the secondary sexual characters are not much developed okay uh, and the genital tubercle is quite enlarged okay there is another one which is called as testicular feminizing feminization syndrome or androgen insensitivity syndrome okay so here what happens is actually they have 40 xy chromosomes but because of the uh, because there is a problem with the testicular receptors okay the resistance to the action of testosterone at the cellular receptor level okay the receptors cannot accept the testosterone so as a result what happens is even though they secrete testosterone they will not be able to um, they will not be able to form okay the they are, they don't uh, develop the characters specifically okay so the what happens is uh, they look like females okay so they appear like normally like females okay so there will be urethral folds genital swellings <clears throat> okay but then if you check the karyotype it will be xy okay so that is androgen insensitivity syndrome and mixed gonadal dysgenesis so this is very quite rare okay so where there could be a testis on one side and an undifferentiated gonad on the other side okay so this is very very quite rare mixed gonadal dysgenesis okay so this is an androgen insensitivity syndrome <clears throat> so they look more like a female all the external features will resemble that of a female but if you to check their uh, karyotyping it could be a uh, xy okay so that's because of the receptor level the testosterone will be absent okay so this is the androgen insensitivity syndrome all right so you can refer the langmans and keith more okay so for your uh, further reading any doubts any doubts <clears throat> 